Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 367 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the new Amazon series Good Omens, based on the novel by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. And this will involve spoilers for both the book and the show, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Erin Lindsay, making her 13th appearance on the show. She's the author of the Rose Gallagher series of historical mysteries from Minotaur, the Bloodbound series of epic fantasy novels from Ace, and the Nicholas Lenoir series of paranormal detective novels from Rock, which she writes under the name E.L. Tetensor. Her latest Rose Gallagher mystery, A Golden Grave, comes out in September. So Erin, welcome to the show. Howdy. The next up, we've got Tom Gerenser, making his sixth appearance on the show. His short fiction appears in magazines such as Realms of Fantasy and in books such as New Voices and Science Fiction. His nonfiction book, Think Like Google, is out now. And his short story, All Our Donkeys Were in Vain, appears in the new anthology, The Best of Galaxy's Edge, 2015 to 2017. So, Tom, welcome to the show. It's great to be back. And also joining us today is Peter Rubin, who you may remember from our panel on Ready Player One back in episode 304, and from our panel on Stranger Things back in episode 216. He's a senior correspondent at Wired, and he's also the author of the nonfiction book Future Presence, How Virtual Reality is Changing Human Connection, Intimacy, and the Limits of Ordinary Life. And you should all go check out his article, Adaptation or Not, Good Omens is a Damned Heavenly Show, over at Wired.com. So, Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dave. Okay, and so let's start off with Tom and have you tell us about your history of reading Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. Sure. Um, I, uh, I'm a huge fan of science fiction and fantasy humor. Always have been, um, ever since I was a little kid. And I, uh, you know, I got onto Terry Pratchett right after, um, right after Douglas Adams, which I was, I was a big fan of as a teenager. Uh, and I think I was still a teenager and my mother brought home, we had this discount store near us and my mother brought home this copy of this really skinny book called The Color of Magic, which had a really cool, um, illustration on the front it was a hardcover book it was i think she got it for like 75 cents and uh and she said here i saw the cover and i thought you might like this and, and so i i was like yeah it looks weird whatever maybe i'll read it <laughs> and then i started reading it and i was instantly like oh my gosh this guy's just like douglas adams i love this guy and um i think i stumbled it was hard to get books by him back then this was in the 1980s in the united states it was hard to get books by him back then and I think I found like one or two others and then and then was like, oh, it's too bad that guy didn't write more. <laughs> and little did I know, I moved to England after uh, after college. I, I, won a, I received the Watson Fellowship to study radio theater in London for a year and uh, really excited when I got there to walk into a bookstore and just see like shelves and shelves full of Terry Pratchett books. And I over the next few years, I devoured as many as I could. I got home and then he started showing up in bookstores over here. And uh, read as much as I could and just really, really absolutely love his creativity and his humor. And then when Good Omens came out, I was really excited to see that because I had read a few Neil Gaiman short stories and really liked them and hadn't really read any anything book length by him. And then, uh, you know, read that book and I absolutely loved it back in the 90s, like right after it came out. And uh, and yeah, and then have, you know, followed, been a fan of both Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett ever since. Had you read Neil Gaiman's Douglas Adams biography at that point? Yes, actually, yes, that's right. That's the first thing I read. Thank you. That's the first thing I read by Neil Gaiman, and I forgot it was by him, but I really liked it. I liked the style. I liked that he kind of wrote it in Douglas Adams' style, and I was—I remember thinking, like, who is this guy? He's, he obviously <laughs> really loves Douglas Adams as much as I do, and he, and he gets the humor. He's like doing kind of the same literary voice as Douglas Adams. And, yeah, I read that when I was over – in England, I think when I, this was in like 1994, so yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely had read that at that time. Now, the color of magic is that reminds me—is that the first Discworld book? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. So that's pretty cool that your mom randomly happens to bring home the first book in that series. Well, my mom, my mom was awesome. She was <laughs> like this. She was like this school nurse from you know. She grew up in Brooklyn, and she was just like a, a local school nurse up in Maine. And for some reason, she, I don't know, she didn't like have this like literary taste that I did, but she just like, she just like assessed me and started buying me these books and randomly like bought me the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy trilogy. Just, they just like showed up in my room one day. She's like, here, you should read these. She had never read them. She was just like, here. 
And I was like, oh my gosh, these are the best books I've ever read in my life as a teenager. And she bought me, she got me uh, The Hobbit when I was in fifth grade. She just was like, here, read this. And she didn't know what it was. She just, just like randomly was like showing up with these amazing, like awesome, seminal fantasy and science fiction novels and like dropping them in my room. And, and I thought like, I was just like, oh, all science fiction and fantasy is just awesome. Because every time my mom buys me a book, it's just great. And then... When I got out on my own and started buying my own books, I was like, oh, no, you know, Tim Powers is right. 90% of everything is crap. Uh, I think that that quote, he didn't come up with that. I'm trying to think. I think it was Theodore Sturgeon no. who, who coined that. You're right. But he, he's the first person I heard it from. But, yeah, you're right. You're yeah, right. Sturgeon's Law, they call it. Um, so how about Aaron? What was your background with Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett? Um, similar, I think. I came to – well – I started with Terry Pratchett, and I, I will admit that I can't remember how I started with Terry Pratchett, but I'm pretty sure it was also via Douglas Adams. Um, and for a long time, the Discworld series was like my go-to beach read. Um, I really enjoyed those. And fun fact, when I first started writing fantasy back in the mid-2000s, that was absolutely what I wanted to do. I wanted to write humorous fantasy, omniscient narrator, all of that, and tried my hand at it, and I... I landed an agent with it who promptly told me there was no way he was ever going to be able to sell any of it um, because you shouldn't bother unless you were Terry Pratchett. And I think... Wait, are you that, Terry Pratchett? <laughs> no, it's possible. Uh, <laughs> that whole thing uh, about my death has been greatly exaggerated. Um, yeah, I, I was really excited about it. And I think that that mentality is still kind of out there. Although I think, I feel like we've seen a bit of a revival of of humorous sci-fi and fantasy lately, which is more than welcome. But as for Gaiman, I came to Gaiman via Pratchett, via Good Omens. Um, and then I think the next thing I read by Neil Gaiman was American Gods. And boy, was that whiplash. <laughs> um, it you know was completely different, obviously. Um, and so it's kind of been interesting because Good Omens was among the first um, things that I, that I had read I read it early on in while I was in my Discworld career. Um, I was probably three or four books in before I before I read Good Omens, and I think um, kind of looking back now and knowing a little bit more about those two authors separately, um, it's it's just really amazing that they came together in the way that they did uh, to to produce Good Omens because it's just like it's such a wonderful marriage. I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent because this is sort of a, a pet peeve of mine. But, yeah, I feel like everybody who writes humorous fantasy and science fiction is told that there's no market for humorous fantasy and science fiction. Like Robert Aspern, yep. I know, was told that. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if Terry Pratchett was told that. Um, and, I mean, I, th I think there's some truth to that. I mean, I think it is kind of a hard sell. But, um, yeah, I, I wish that people were more uh, receptive to it because I love it. Well, I mean, and there are some pretty spectacular examples of that not being the case. And maybe that they're the exception to the rule. But, um, and, you know, I get it. The agent's job is to say, look, this uh, this is what the market looks like. And, you know, write what you love. But this is going to be an uphill battle. Um, and, and I do think these things wax and wane. But... Yeah, it's. I feel like that's always been a bit overstated, and the and the enduring popularity of of Douglas Adams and Terry Pratchett, and 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 that's a very specific brand of humor too. It's a very British brand of humor, and the fact that that American audiences and and Canadian audiences and and non UK audiences have continued over the decades to embrace that suggests there's an appetite for it, right. um, and particularly to explore other corners of of what constitutes humor. So. I kind of feel like that whole thing was overplayed, but who knows? Well, so now that you, oh, go ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. I know you don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but um, but I just wanted to mention something. I, I wonder if uh, Terry Pratchett was told the same thing when he started, because the Color of Magic. When I first read it, there were a few lines in it where he directly cribbed them out of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I don't remember what they are now, but I remember reading them and going, "Oh, that's that's copied whole cloth right out of Hitchhiker's Guide." That that line right there. And um, I remember thinking, he did it like three or four times in the book, and I remember thinking, why is he doing this? He doesn't need to do it. He's he's super funny without without doing that. He should have left that out, or maybe he did it by accident. But I wonder if he was told originally, like, you sh you're just like Douglas Adams, the world, you know, if you're not Douglas Adams, don't try this. Um, I know that, secondly, the other point I wanted to make is I certainly, you know, I 
same as you, Aaron, except I didn't keep writing fiction, um, and I, I never developed much of a career in it, but I, um, I, I also wanted to be, I'm basically a Pratchett and Douglas Adams wannabe, and I, I tried to write that kind of stuff, and I was told over and over again by established writers, like, don't do this, you, you know, you can't, if you're, unless you're Terry Pratchett or Douglas Adams, don't try to write science fiction or fantasy humor. All right. Well, I have more to say on that, but I, I, I want to get Peter in here uh, before we go on too long about this. So, Peter, what, what was your uh, background with uh, Douglas? Ad or sorry, with uh, Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman? Well, I think you were right the first time, Dave, <laughs> because I think that the only thread that I share with everybody is the Douglas Adams one. You know, as a kid, I like everybody else, uh, just was completely infatuated with with the Hitchhiker's novels. But my tastes at the time weren't nearly as evolved as Aaron's or Tom's. My my taste in comic fantasy was shaped probably more, uh, as much as I hate to admit it, by Piers Anthony's Xanth novels uh, than anything else. Um, You're among friends so here. So I never Peter. read. Oh, good to hear. So I so so you also know the like retroactive shame that you feel about it. <laughs> um, and so my. Uh, my experience with, with Terry Pratchett was um, completely nil. I never read the Discworld books. I was completely unfamiliar with him. I fell in love with the Sandman comics in the 90s, and I devoured them all, and then American Gods. But I had never read Good Omens. Uh, and then just serendipitously, last year at Comic-Con, I ended up meeting and, and talking with, with Neil. Uh, he was there, obviously, to talk about a few things, one of them being the kind of the Sandman universe stuff that Vertigo was doing, and the other being kind of the first footage from Good Omens. And I knew a little bit about the origin story and how he and Terry started writing it, but then just kind of talking to him about it and hearing the way he spoke about Terry was touching. I mean, he's such a, a kind of a good-hearted seeming uh, guy and talking about the relationship was was incredibly touching. And so I kind of had to make the decision, am I gonna read this first or am I gonna wait for the show? And I ultimately made the decision to wait for the show. So I feel like I'm coming from a completely different standpoint, having since gone back and, and begun the book, which I'm a little more than halfway through now. Um, and so it's, you know, experiencing an adaptation adaptation first and then going back to the source has its own kind of brand of whiplash uh not as much as going from good omens to american gods but but all the same right well i'll, I'll say i actually haven't read good omens and i actually i actually got a copy of it um and i was going to try to read it but i'm currently in the middle of a four volume history of tabletop role-playing games for an upcoming interview so i decided i just had to have some triage on in what i read this week hmm. um, only four volumes <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, hopefully there will be a fifth one soon. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and so I'm not the world's biggest Terry Pratchett expert, but my understanding is that I think he published his first novel when he was like 17 or something. And um, he wrote a bunch of novels before Discworld, where I'm not sure if they're all humor or not. I think some of them aren't. Um, I don't know if anyone else knows more about that. Don't know about that. No, I don't know. No, but um, I mean, so yeah. if... You have the impression of that just reading the the opening parts of the preface of of Good Omens, where there's and, and the opening parts of the book where there are a lot of meta cracks about trying to cut it as an author. <laughs> so I, I mean, I want I don't know for sure if this is true, but I I wonder if he had to publish serious like like more serious books to kind of break in, and then you know sort of took a turn into humor once he was established. Was that guy Gaiman you're talking about? No, no Pratchett. Yeah. Pratchett, I, I wouldn't know. I know he was a he started out as like a technician or an engineer in a nuclear power plant. I, I don't think he did do serious books first. I, I remember reading some, I don't know if it was an article or what. And this is, this is you know, take this with a grain of salt because this is probably something I read 20 years ago or more. But uh, he started out as like a, a nuclear power plant engineer or technician. And he was, you know, he was really into science and computers and stuff. And then he he just started like, he, he got really fed up with how everything was so logical though and he started writing i think he just started writing his book, first book which was color of magic i don't think he wrote anything serious first i think he wrote that and that was the first thing he ever tried and i think that got published um and that just kind of took off from there hmm. i should i guess i should have like looked this up before we started recording because I, I i swear he had a book I, I i owned it but i never um got around to reading it um but it's just from the cover, it looked like it was more like science fiction, um, something about an alien planet. Um, but I don't know. Let's move on to something that we know more about. Um, well, so, Aaron, so you mentioned American Gods. And um, on Facebook, 
uh, you were mentioning the TV adaptation of American Gods. So Ugh, what a hot mess. <laughs> So how did yeah. that how did that I inform mean, your expectations going into uh, Good Omens? It, it gave me a, a, a tremendous degree of trepidation, that's for sure. Um, you know, I liked American Gods as a book. I didn't love it, but I liked it, um, and I I couldn't think of sort of any real reason why it would be difficult to adapt. Um, and I, you, you're, you're never going to find a bigger Ian McShane fan than me. So finding out that he was cast in the lead and that was great. And then we, I've tried so hard to watch it, both my husband and I, and he, he adores American Gods as a book, but it's just so disjointed and it's so, it's so gaming. And, and I know that that sounds like a really negative thing, but it's just, it, it needs a better edit. Anyway, point being, it's a hot mess. Um, and I think if you haven't read the book, it's probably pretty much unwatchable. So I was quite nervous about Good Omens, and I was nervous about Good Omens too, just because I think the type of humor in the book is tricky to translate to the screen. Um, it's it's such an omniscient narrator and such a, a wry narrator, um, and it's I was really worried that some of those jokes simply wouldn't land. Some of that humor would just not not work on the screen. Um, and I think some of those fears proved to be justified. But but overall, it, it was a delight. Overall. I have quibbles, of course. Yeah, well, so how about Peter? Since you were going into this with few or no, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, Expectations. Pre- yeah, what's what's the word? I'm, I'm... Preconceived notions. Preconceived notions. Preconceptions. Preconceptions. Uh, what did you kind of? What were your initial impressions of uh, of Good Omens? So, so there, there's one there's one little bit of sort of preparatory influence that that I I didn't mention, and that is a couple of years ago, my wife started. Uh, she she started saying she said so I I got this book because she had she and I had both loved American Gods. We both came to the book kind of well after publication. Uh, and based on that, she, she said, you know, I went and I got this other book that, uh, that Neil Gaiman had written with Terry Pratt. She was like, I bailed. She was like, it's unreadable. It's <laughs> like the, the, the Douglas, you know, she just wasn't in the mood. It was a more of a mindset thing. She was like the Douglas Adams impression. They were like, she was, she basically, her takeaway was these are two men who are so pleased with themselves and with their hilarity that it, it, it basically t- turned her off immediately. And so that was the only thing that I knew about Good Omens as sort of refracted through somebody who was close to me. Uh, and so going in, we watched it together. Um, you know, we had the screeners and watched them together and we both just uh, really adored it. Though I would point out that it took, it, it took a little bit of time to get there. And, and just actually to Aaron's point about American Gods, I totally agree, though I really did enjoy the first season. It was... Uh, and I think it, stand, it it kind of presents a really good contrast from Good Omens in that it was unwatchable if you didn't if you weren't familiar with the text. And I wrote about this when the sh- when the show first began. It is um, it brings you along. You basically have to uh, you have to submit to the riptide that is the bizarreness of the American Gods show, at least in the first couple of episodes. Things happen without explanation. Uh, it, it's like, it's truly bizarre. And if you make it through, I can only imagine what sort of dizzying ride that it is as a viewer who's unfamiliar with the book. Whereas Good Omens, thanks in large part to the, the, the preservation of that omniscient narrator, is it's incredibly welcoming. It is, um, I really found myself sort of swept away in large part because of the chemistry between uh, Tenet and Sheen, which um, I, I think for that show to work, it really did depend on uh, Aziraphale and Crowley having that sort of push-pull relationship. And I think that, the, you know, the show was able to dig into some more subtextual layers of their relationship that the book didn't really bother with. And I think uh, I think Neil Gaiman's kind of insistence on authorship may have doomed American God's second season. But here, I think that the consistency of the voice and the decision from the get-go to preserve the tone as best as possible really was uh, sort of a benefit to the show. Well, right. And let's just set up what the show is about. So you mentioned uh, Azira Fail and uh, Crowley. I'm going to try not mm-hmm. to say Crowley, which is how I, I keep know, wanting I, to I say it. I know, I the same mistake. Ditto, too. it's so hard not to, though. 
<laughs> um, but so yeah, so you have this this angel named Aziraphale and this demon named Crowley, and they've known each other since the beginning of time, since the Garden of Eden, and have been stationed on Earth. You know, and the angel's supposed to be doing good deeds, and the demon's supposed to be doing evil deeds. And at some point in this long interactions that they have, they decide to kind of like. Uh, both coast and they figure that if like neither of them is really doing much of anything it'll cancel each other out so why are they like working so hard all the time and um as it gets closer to the present uh armageddon is coming and the antichrist is born and crowley's supposed to deliver the antichrist to this satanic uh convent or something where they're going to switch the babies so that the antichrist baby is positioned with this powerful american diplomat um, but, uh, there's this, through this comedy of errors, uh, the Antichrist baby ends up with just this sort of middle-class, uh, British family. Um, and Aziraphale and Crowley don't realize this. And so they spend their whole, you know, the next 11 years, uh, trying to, um, you know, exert equal influence on what the baby that they think is the Antichrist baby so that he grows up to be kind of normal and well-adjusted and doesn't want to destroy the world, uh, because, they kind of like the world the way it is and they don't want Armageddon to come. And I think that premise is brilliant. I was, uh, I was telling them, I was describing the show to my girlfriend as I was watching it. And I was like, I think this, this, this is the premise of the show. I just think is so clever and so funny. Um, and I tell you, I, everyone here agrees, right? Basic premise, really Basic strong. Basic premise is awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Lead characters are awesome. And the rest of it is maybe just window dressing. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. And, and I, and one thing that I loved about the show was that, you know, while it may have backgrounded the them a little bit, which I'm sure we're going to get to, I thought that it gave just enough life to some of the secondary characters that I enjoyed them maybe in a way that wasn't as integral to the reading experience. Hmm. Right. So Aziraphale and Crowley are played by Michael Sheen and David Tennant, and they are amazingly good. Like, I, I think, like, you know, it's it's hard to even say you know, who might be better or whatever. But for me, Michael Sheen, like, I, I literally don't think his import, his performance could be improved on. Like, every he's this, you know, he's this angel who uh, is very often put in positions where he has to lie and he's just terrible at lying. And it's it's just really funny to watch. And just the, 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 there's this whole running gag where he uh, he had this flaming sword and he gave it away. And people from heaven are, are like, where, where's that flaming sword? <laughs> you know, we need that back. And he's like, oh, it's around here somewhere. And just every time that came back, I was just cracking up. Yeah, and they they did such a brilliant job. One of the and this is a, this is a Pratchett thing. Pratchett clearly has a, a serious had a serious issue, as many people do, with bureaucracy and especially British bureaucracy. So he he kind he casts both heaven and hell as these, you know, incompetent bureaucracies where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, and so they're not just asking after the flaming sword. You know, it's like squinting at a clipboard saying, "My records show that you were issued a flaming sword." <laughs> Yeah. And we need that back in the inventory. So that was great. But but back to the cast, I completely agree with you, Dave. But did anyone else like, okay, so so David Tennant was perfect, but he was also distractingly doing his absolute spot on best Bill Nye from Love Actually. Oh, a little bit of that. A little bit uh, of that. Spot I, on. I, I didn't notice the love actually, although I did see that movie. I did notice him in that, but I was thinking, uh, I did notice Bill Nye for sure, but I was thinking more like, uh, uh, un what is it? Underworld. Oh, Underworld, really? Underworld 2. So do me a favor and just go to YouTube and watch some clips of Bill Nye's storyline, which is, by the way, the best storyline in Love Actually, where he plays this bitter aging rock star. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I can it remember is 100% it. Crowley. 100%. It's kind of funny when you talk about who do these characters remind you of, because my girlfriend Stephanie, when she popped in, she was kind of like, Crowley really reminds me of Neil Gaiman, you know, dressed all in black and kind of sauntering mm -hmm. around or whatever. And she's like, so I, I wonder if, uh, you know, if there's like a Neil Gaiman is Crowley, Terry Pratchett is uh, a zero fail kind of thing going on, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of interesting. I mean, like. Me. You know, it, it, it kind of, I mean, I only saw, I saw Terry Pratchett a few times, but he always struck me, yeah, as sort of like, like skinny Santa Claus or something. He's just very like jolly and ebullient. So I could kind of see that, you know. Um, and then Neil Gaiman obviously has the kind of like dressed all in black kind of rock star thing going on. 
Um, but it was interesting because I listened to an interview and Neil Gaiman says that when they started out that he, Neil Gaiman, wrote the first 5,000 words of Good Omens and there was only one character. There was Crowley or Crawley, I think, it, at the beginning. And then uh, Terry Pratchett, when he got the pages, split them up into the two characters. So in a way, Neil Gaiman kind of created the demon and uh, Terry Pratchett kind of created the angel. So, yeah, there's maybe something to that analysis. Hmm. Well, that's whatever pretty, yeah. whatever the origin, it's an, it's a great buddy comedy, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I I was uh, like like the rest of you. I was completely blown away by the chemistry between Michael Sheen and David Tennant, and I felt like the more I watched the show, the more the more it was obvious that they were they were the center of it. They were carrying everything in it, and and uh, like Peter said, the rest was kind of just window dressing. I think Aaron said that to, I, to I, her credit. I did <laughs> say that, but I, I feel like I I mean it's it's definitely we seemed to all be in agreement in that. But just go, going back. To, to what your girlfriend said, Dave, it just I had this momentary conspiracy theory where I thought perhaps the the buddy comedy relationship between I'm sorry to do this again, Bill Nye and his manager <laughs> in love actually is quite similar. <laughs> the the long suffering manager, anyways, whatever. And they and they <laughs> and they find out that at the at Christmas that their love is the only love that matters. Their bromance is like more important than everything else, anyways. I, I I honestly don't remember Love Actually that well, so I, I can't I can't comment. But I'm sure it's a great I'm sure it's a great theory. Um, <laughs> but why don't you say more, Aaron, about when you say that the why don't you just say who are these other characters who you described as kind of the window dressing characters? Yeah, I, the, so just maybe as a capstone comment going into that, um, I think actually one of the the downsides of this adaptation for me was that perhaps it was a little bit too faithful. Um, because there are a number of, of secondary characters in the book, and I'm not sure that they add much to the book, and I'm not sure that they add anything to the show, and perhaps that there's nothing wrong with any of them, but if we spent a little bit more time with some of them, then they maybe would have resonated and mattered more, and so maybe some editing down of secondary characters would have been called for. Um, the secondary characters, the main one um, is the, the Antichrist baby. Um, who we Adam meet Young. eventually as an 11 year old, Adam Young and his gang of, of three friends. So the four of them and their, their gang of the them that hang out in the woods and just do what 11 year olds do. So there's that whole storyline of Adam who doesn't know he's the antichrist slowly coming into his powers. Um, and you know, his imagination triggers chaos in the real world. Then you have a, another sub storyline, a, a subplot of, of um, Anathema Device, who is the descendant of a witch called Agnes Nutter, who wrote a book of nice and accurate prophecies um, that were all completely exact in every respect. And so the whole family has ever since, I guess, the 17th century or whenever she was burned at the stake, um, been trying to avert the apocalypse that she predicted in her book. And so Anathema Device is, is the young woman who's currently um, come to the, to the village to seek out the Antichrist in accordance with the prophecies. And then there's a final grouping that's uh, the descendant of a, a witch finder, the very same witch finder that burned Agnes Nutter at the stake or tried to. Um, and his crazy mentor in the Witchfinder army was played by Michael McKean bewilderingly. And then the, the, how to describe her, uh, painted Jezebel. I don't know. The, this middle-aged woman who is a part-time, uh, madam and a part-time, um, prostitute who lives in the same building as the, as Shadwell, who's the Witchfinder sergeant or whatever he is anyways michael mckean's character who's the crazy kind of scottish but not really scottish um witch finder guy who lives this horrible bachelor life and his only purpose in life is to chase down witches so those are kind of did i did i forget anyone uh well why don't you other okay, than so, heaven and hell right well yeah, so just the so, demons and angels Right. Well, well well just sticking with those characters so just to be clear there's newton pulsifer who's the descendant of the witch finder who burns anathema devices ancestor for being a witch uh and then there's, there's the witch finder sergeant shadwell 
And then he lives in this apartment where his landlord basically is uh, Madame Tracy, who's, yeah, like you said, who's like a part-time prostitute and part-time like psychic or medium or something. Um, and then Peter, you were saying there's some, uh, there's some other, <laughs> there's yet more characters. Oh, yeah. I mean, we haven't even gotten to the, uh, to the celestial realms yet. So we've got John Hamm as, uh, as Gabriel and a whole crew of angels. Um, you know, G Gabriel who becomes some kind of more unhinged over time with his frustrations with Aziraphale. And I think John Hamm kind of does this really nice job of going from sort of a uh, foppish buttoned up, maybe more process oriented version of Aziraphale to a completely unhinged sort of rage pot um, as they get closer to, uh, as they get closer to Armageddon itself. Um, and, uh, and then on the other side, you have the Dukes of Hell, um, whose names I can't even remember now. It's Haster and Ligur. And uh, Ned Dennehy as Haster is kind of truly disgusting. Um, you know, these are, these are, everyone has, the the perfect number of frogs or carbuncles attached to their <laughs> face and head uh i think the one nice thing about the sort of production design is they really do get kind of the visceral grossness of demonry across in a way that you don't like in in movies and shows like demons always kind of ooze but uh or, or 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 are in the the process maybe of rotting away in some sort of um uh peripheral or some sort of um uh, what do you call the uh, perpetual motion device, like a perpetual uh, half rot. But this is a really kind of disgusting, sticky, uh, very kind of humorously visceral version uh, of demonry that I really enjoyed. Okay, wait, uh, so, so, so for people who, 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 for people who read the book, is there an explanation in the book of why they have lizards on their heads? Not that I recall. And some of those characters don't actually even exist in the book. Like Gabriel, I think, is mentioned only tangentially um, in the book. And, and his addition, he was the one example of a character that wasn't in the book, but is in the show that, to me anyway, made good sense. Um, mm -hmm. I think the ones they butchered the most were the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, and especially death. And, and I have to say, the, the problem with death as a character... So death, if is is he in every Discworld book? I think he is, right? At some point, he's certainly in most of them. Death yeah. is a is a classic Pratchett character. Death speaks in all caps. Um, he is kind of the classic Pratchett character, in my opinion. Um, and he's in Good Omens, and he speaks all in caps. And they just completely got it all wrong for me. Um, I I I love Brian Cox. He's totally wrong for this. Whoever they cast as the body, which was clearly not Brian Cox, the, I don't see death as some tall, gangly. Anyways, I might be going down a rabbit hole here, but I just that was just so disappointing for me. What you really wanted was a was a Benedict Cumberbatch voice, or a uh, I don't know. I could even go for a James Earl Jones in there. It just you well, somebody Benedict who sounds Cumberbatch. like all caps, and that's the other big flop. Anyway. Yeah, Benedict Cumberbatch was Satan, so you know you can only. But was he though? That, that, that's like so. So here's the thing: aside from Satan being the most ridiculously bad CGI I've seen in a long time, you cast so Benedict Cumberbatch. It makes perfect sense to cast that voice as Satan, doesn't it? And just as it made perfect sense to cast that voice as Smog, and what do you do? You CGI the voice. You you completely digitize mm -hmm. the voice. That's like hiring Naomi Campbell to, to, to wear your clothes and then putting a bag over her head. Like, it just makes no sense to me. Like, that's, you had one job. Your job was to be that voice. And then you just completely did a computer generated varnish over the voice. It's just mind blowingly dumb, in my opinion. But so, so I think this actually does a great job of highlighting the, the experiential difference in having come to the show with knowledge of the book or not. For me, you know, my issue with the with the Four Horsemen wasn't based on any sort of miscasting. It was the way that they were kind of stitched together. Um, and I think that the book did a slightly better job maybe of contextualizing them before we assembled them. And it was, you know, it was the, sort of this humorous D thread on the show where this sort of uh, everyman package courier 
you know, would find the, the four horsemen in various parts of the world. And then they, they would assemble at Megiddo for, for Armageddon to begin. But for me, that casting wasn't an issue at all. I didn't have that ingrained sense of what Death's Voice should sound like. I didn't have a sense, uh, you know, one thing I didn't love is that just as in the book, they never really explain how pestilence becomes pollution, but, you know, I'm willing to set that aside. What they did do, I think, one thing that I saw people complaining about who were diehard fans of the book was that there was another set of four horsemen, right? You had the actual sort of Hell's Angels that met up with the four horsemen and gave this sort of humorous counterpoint to, to the doom and gloom. And they're nowhere to be seen in the show. I only have just started to meet them now at the point in the book where I am. So the Four Horsemen for me weren't a sticking point in the slightest. I had the, my interest waned the most when we were with the them, even though going back to the book, I think I preferred the them from the show to the them in the, in the book. All right. Well, okay. So you may be getting the point or you may be getting the idea listening to this. There's a lot of stuff in the book. And it's a very difficult task to adapt it to a six episode TV show. Um, I think that, you know, and, and there's this issue of like, how much do you want to change the story around to make it, you know, flow more smoothly in, in a different format? And how much do you want to stay, you know, stay true to the source material? But I mean, not for myself, not having really any familiarity with the source material Certainly my perception is that there was just too much stuff going on in mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, and what, I guess... Uh, I'm, cu I'm curious, Dave, and or everybody else, what, you know, what could have been excised in a way that would have streamlined the show a little bit? Uh, you know, I thought that certainly they could... There were, there were times that it felt like it could jump from place to place, but as the show went on and they began to, to focus in more on the tension between Aziraphale and Crowley's friendship, I thought that all the work that they had done actually paid off to me it didn't feel like it was overstuffed so much as it was a uh, kind of uh, narrowing of scope well let me let me jump in so i i thought that i mean i wouldn't really change any of the zero fail crowley stuff I, I pretty much thought all that stuff was great um I, if i were going to cut anything i i thought that the madam tracy and shadwell characters got too much screen time relative mm -hmm. to the role that they played in the story which seems like in the end wasn't a whole bunch um I agree agree i i would actually you know if if your choices are keep it six episodes and slash or make it 10 episodes and build on those characters a little bit more i would probably have preferred the latter except i don't know what you do with the them in the meantime because they're kind of boring enough mm -hmm. as it is but right right th that the whole anathema newton that that whole foursome of of the, the the witch finder side of things and the prophecy side of things, it, when you when you get right down to brass tacks, they actually don't influence the plot very much at all. Mm -hmm. So those would be logical choices, and I suspect that part of the dilemma for for Gaiman, I mean, it's anytime you're adapting a longer work to a shorter format, you you face those dilemmas. But I think for him, you know, the dream of adapting Good Omens was was going back for so long and Terry Pratchett having passed, I think he probably felt a great deal of pressure to be as f faithful as possible to the original text. Um, and, and I think perhaps that might have got in the way of some more tweaks and updates that might have serviced the show better. It's speculation. I, think, but. I, I, I agree with you partly in the sense that I do think that the younger generation of that foursome uh, Anathema Device and uh, and and Newton Pulsifer were. I didn't even think that the the acting performances were that good. On the other hand, I think that Shadwell and Madame Tracy both had great comic performances from Michael McKean and Miranda Richardson, and I think that they actually present us kind of a really nice distillation of the energy, like the tension and the love between the Zero and Crowley. They kind of play that out where they are at least from the viewpoint of one of those two characters, they are diametrically opposed. And then one is a little more gentle and maybe accommodating. The other is completely prickly and set in their ways about the moral divide between them. But then they come together in this other way. And so I think it's kind of Gaiman's way of saying like, look, all that love that you are, that you're gleaning from the Aziraphale Crowley relationship, let's make that a little bit more explicit in in this other one between Shadwell and uh, and Madam Tracy. I want to get Tom back in here. Tom, what do you think about all this? 
Yeah, I, I agree to to a large extent with what everybody is saying here. Um, I I did think that the the characters, the especially the younger characters, got kind of short shrift. Um, I I kind of disagree that you know I, I'm happy with the amount that Michael McKeon um, and and his uh, you know his co character there were on the screen for. I I liked I really liked I thought Michael McKeon did a great job, and uh, and he I, he did seem to kind of have. Uh, uh, there, there did seem maybe they didn't figure on the plot of the overall story so much, but there was a nice story arc between him and uh, and what was her name again? The Madame the, Tracy. Madame Tracy. There was a nice story arc there where you know he starts out, he's always yelling at her, "Away with you, harlot!" And uh, every time he sees her, but but as you get to know them a little bit more, you you see that they're really very fond of each other, in, in spite of the fact that he keeps calling her a harlot. And by the <laughs> end of the by the end of the show. You know, it's obvious that they're in love. So I thought that was kind of a nice arc, and it, I, I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed his. I think uh, Aaron, you said something about his accent. Yeah. I think it, I think it was supposed to be a Northern England accent, um, just just having lived there. But also uh, in the book, there's actually a line where it says yeah. uh, his accent careens all over England like a delivery van. <laughs> so uh, so I thought he I thought he did a great job of. Uh, all, all over the UK, like a delivery van, and, and this actually, I had to look up that line because I was so confused when I when I watched the show because Michael McKean, <laughs> who I love, um, he's really good at accents, and what I was hearing was a rubbish Scottish accent. Accent, and I was like, I'm confused. Like I'm, I guarantee he can do a better job of this. If you've seen Spinal Tap, you know he's very good at accents. Right. Um. And so, so what's the deal here? Is there a reason? And indeed, there is a reason. The reason is, is spelled out quite clearly in the book that, that he has this weird, almost fake sounding accent. So yeah, in fact, yeah. it was perfect. But, but I mean, I agree yeah, with yeah, you. Like I, I could watch Michael McKean all day. And so that's sort of why I prefaced it by saying in a perfect world, I would actually like to see more rather than less. It's just right. by having all of these two dimensional characters they kind of detract from one another. It's not that there's an, anything inherently wrong with any of them. There's just too many of them. Well, just just from a plot perspective, I mean, Newton Pulsifer shuts off the nuclear, you know, military base at right. the climax. And other than that, like if you had some other way for that to happen or whatever, do any of those characters impact the plot? This is what I'm really saying. at all? Yeah, not much. Not much. And I, and I think the you know, the them... The, the four young children, including the Antichrist, were, um, they were really, yeah, they, there wasn't really much for them to do. But if you read the book, there wasn't really much for them to do in the book either. It's almost like they were there as kind of a comic way to show that kids have good hearts but don't really know much about how things work. So every time they talk, like, it's just funny to see, like, their misunderstandings of how they perceive the world. And that's kind of the, that's the, that's, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's kind of the extent of their appearance in the book. Is it's just kind of like, oh look, they aren't they cute? They don't really know what's going on. But also the the sort of burgeoning, not friendship, but the the, the kind of connection between Adam, the Antichrist, and Anathema Device. You know, she gives him those sort of new age conspiracy magazines, and that's what ends up catalyzing a lot of the right. disasters that that really start the path to Armageddon. So in that way, she's a bit of a plot fulcrum. Um, and I think that it's just a matter of like, you want to have the sort of generational, uh, you know, everything is these sort of generational cross connections, right? You have them in the Agnes and Anathema and, and uh, thou shalt not commit adultery pulse of her down to Newton pulse of her in the present day. And then you have, you know, the adults of today and the kids of today uh, and, and I think that there's actually something really enjoyable about the way that this feels like a multi-generational read in, in a way that a lot of sci-fi and fantasy doesn't. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I think, I think what they, one thing they could have done if they wanted to make it longer to your point, Aaron, um, they could have kind of taken a page from, uh, from stranger things book or from it or where they could have, like, like you said, you know, the, it's not so much that the kids got short shrift in the show. It's just that they got short shrift period in the show and the book. Mm -hmm. And they could have, they could have said, well, let's, let's turn the, let's, let's adapt this, but let's change from the book and let's make these into real characters and do it up like, uh, like stranger things. I sort of felt like every time they were on screen, they were kind of shouting too much. Like they weren't talking like real kids. They weren't muttering or, 
um, which which maybe is down to the direction. But uh, but I felt like it could have been more like Stranger Things or more like it, where the kids were like real kids, but they were doing like they were doing something real and they had a real struggle that they were trying to overcome. That might have been fun if they wanted to make it longer. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I'm sure. I, I, I well, I, I strongly suspect that Neil Gaiman would have been happier to make this longer. I think that the issue was the budget, and I just think they couldn't. You know, like there's so many special effects in this that I think that you know they had to get the BBC and Amazon together just to like get enough money to make these six episodes. Uh, I don't think like ten I, episodes. I think they blew their budget on cast. Hmm. <laughs> they, have, I mean, it's an amazing cast that they've assembled, um, and and some of them just. As I said before, I just think they they weren't utilized right. Um, I, I like Brian Cox. I think it's weird to cast him as death. Um, Benedict Cumberbatch was a great idea for Satan, and they totally wasted it. Also, he has no dialogue, so why bother? Let's hope he did it for free. Then there's mm-hmm. Frances McDormand. I adore Frances McDormand, but I would not have cast her as God. And this, to me, was the other big flaw. <sighs> The, the humor in this show is so British in, in the book is so, so very British. The, the execution is almost Python, Terry Gilliam esque in, in some, in some places. I really think you need a British, that, that, that voiceover right at the beginning of the show is, is the palette primer. It sets the tone for the humor and for the whole thing. And I just think having an American do that to me sets the palette wrong. And yeah, so I couldn't agree more. I, I just agree I needed a Brit, and and if I I just got to say, if it had been me, I'd have cast David Attenborough. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I thought I thought that you know I love Frances McDormand like you do, Aaron, and uh, and I was kind of psyched to see her there at first, but then you could hear like the turns of phrase that she would use. You would think, well, that's supposed to be said in a British accent. That doesn't make sense if you say it in an American accent. And the more that went on, like, and and I read a trivia piece too that Neil Gaiman wanted to. You know, there's so many great footnotes in the book. Like anybody who reads Pratchett knows that, um, I don't know, a good 10% of the book is footnotes. footnotes yeah. He just puts all these really funny footnotes in there. And Neil Gaiman really wanted to press to get those into the into the show. And so he did. He just did it all as Francis McDormand narrating the footnotes. Um, or pieces of narration, too, because there's such a hypnotic quality to the way Pratchett and Gaiman build this text where... You can watch, you can just, if you just cut out all the subtext and you just read the dialogue, then the scenes don't really make sense. But if you put all the narration in between the dialogue, suddenly it's hilarious. And so a lot of times in the show, they would, they would be doing the dialogue or they would be doing um, some action and then they would cut away and give you some of the narration to show you like, here, this actually makes sense and is very funny. Um, so, so yeah, I, I fully agree that I felt, I felt more and more strongly as the show went on that that should have been a, a British voice, some kind of British narrator. All right. So let me say, going back to the, the idea of, um, the kids getting short shrift, I just feel like from a structural story point of view that Adam is the main character in this. Cause he's the one who makes, who has a decision to make at the climax where like the world's about to end and he has to make a choice. Does he accept Satan as his father or does he you know, stick with his human father. And that, and the whole story is sort of building up to and revolves around that. And so I feel like that's why it would be really important to, to build up his relationship with his human father. And sort of my, my biggest difficulty with the way the story develops is that I felt like Adam is like totally nice kid. And then more or less for no reason turns evil for like one or two episodes. And then for more or less, no reason turns really nice again. And I think the story and, and I think the the issue is that he's like he's got this great life and he's popular and he's got these great friends and he seems to have a good relationship with his family and all this stuff. And I feel like it just would work a lot better if he didn't have friends and he had a strange relationship with his father and he suddenly starts developing all this power. And that's really appealing to him because he's felt powerless his whole life. And now he has an opportunity to make a change. And. Um, you know, and, and if he had had a strange relationship with his father, then I feel like it would have more emotional impact at the end where he rejects the devil and embraces the family that raised him because they were always there for them. They were always there for him, even if they weren't perfect. Um, and I, yeah, I, I just felt like, yeah, that, 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 the Adam's character needed more, more like that going on with it. 
Yeah. I, I kind of like that, that Adam's character is sort of cast as an everyman kid. And I think that's kind of the point. One of the things that they, they reiterate throughout um, the, the story is, you know, that, that good and evil aren't really things that actually influence the world, that it's just human beings and they're not fundamentally good or fundamentally bad and they make mistakes and all this kind of stuff. And so, and I, and I can definitely buy Adam suddenly turning bad as his powers, as he starts to realize that he actually has these powers. His, his turn at the end though, where he turns back to being good makes less sense. And I have to say that I fundamentally did not understand the climax the first time. It took me a few minutes for it to sink in. Like I, like what just happened? How, how did this line of dialogue where he basically says, you're not my father. How does that turn into sort of melting Satan and and the apocalypse is over. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but it. I think that was because he was it. put in. He was put in charge of reality during the uh, during Armageddon. He was given all the power to be in charge of everything about reality, and that's why when he would talk about, you know, originally it was supposed to be that he would be raised by this U.S. diplomat, and he would be schooled in like power and wanting power, and then when he was given that power to like make anything he wanted become reality what he would make become reality was this massive war and it would turn into a war between heaven and hell and he would bring them from heaven and from hell into reality where they could fight. That was his power. He was he was not uh, a devil by virtue of being, or by vice of being born Satan's son. He was an angel because Satan wasn't a devil to begin with. He was an angel who fell. So I think they explain this in the movie as well as the book. Like Adam was not a, a devil just because he was Satan's son. He was... He was just this powerful angel, but he was a super powerful angel who at the end times would be given all this power. So instead of being in that diplomat's house, he was raised in this group of kids in England. And, uh, you know, anathema gave him, filled his head with all these ideas from, from the new Aquarian magazines. And then he started getting interested in like Tibetans tunneling under the earth and flying saucers and Atlantis rising. And so that power that made him able to like bring things into reality acted on those ideas, which it wasn't supposed to, but he's, that's when he started pulling like Atlantis up from the bottom and he started doing all these other things. Um, and then when it became, you know, Armageddon itself, the final hour, the final minute, he was basically in that minute, he was all powerful. And the idea was that him being all, all powerful to affect reality in any way he wanted was supposed to, like I said, bring heaven and hell into reality and make them fight. But um, but what he did instead was he chose because he realized he liked his friends. He chose like, no, I'm going to I'm going to banish Satan back to hell, uh, which which was not in the plan. But but that's what he did. So that, that actually the ending to me, I, I thought was extremely satisfying. And I found the ending not only satisfying, but also very sweet. I, I thought it was a really nicely wrapped. It was one of my favorite episodes. I mean, I thought that what ha I was fine with what happened, the idea that he tells the devil, you were never my father, and then that makes it so he never was his father. Like, that all, that made sense to me. I just felt like it wasn't emotionally developed enough. But, um, Peter, what do you think about this? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was – I had no problem with the sort of narrative flow of it, but it felt um, – at least with the, the, the events themselves, but the – the time that was devoted to them, the logic that led up to them, it felt like it was a bit of a, it was rushed through, if that makes any sense. You know, like Aaron has pointed out, the, the kind of showdown with Satan is, is so fast um, and is a, just more of a bit of a spectacle than anything else. But for me, the, what really marked kind of Adam's uh, descent and then redemption or ascent and then redemption is, is that uh, it felt in the show, at least more than the book, it felt somewhat um, unearned in that, you know, he kind of, as his abilities grow and he becomes more powerful in the book, he's kind of hearing the voices more and you get a sense of the struggle that's happening within him in the, in the show. He just eventually one day his eyes glow and he hovers above his friends right. and says, the adults screwed this up. Let's just, let's start over. And then you can, you can all rule the world with me. And it felt, it felt rushed into and it felt rushed out of, uh, which was just kind of my problem with that quadrant of, of youngsters. Like the them were one of my least favorite elements of the show. Of course, going back to the book, they, they, they're, it's a little bit different. And with the luxury of, of prose and omniscience, you just get a little bit more of what Adam's going through. 
So I didn't mind how they resolved the story, but I did mind kind of how they got there. Yeah, I think it just for me that 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 climax fell flat. And I just thought, you know, they, they had shown such a, a wonderful amount of humanization and imagination with all of the angels and the demons. And then Satan shows up and it's your bog standard giant horny thing with a tail <laughs> horns horns thing so sorry <laughs> uh and it's just lame you know how much better would it have been if if it was actually benedict cumberbatch in a suit or something like that and and there's like something there's something to tempt adam there like what's to tempt adam about about this this giant thing that rises up out of the like i don't know I just thought it would, there was fundamentally, and this is not something that can be said about anything associated with Neil Gaiman very often, it lacked imagination. When you, so, so, Peter, in your review, you said that the sort of schlockiness of the special effects was kind of true to the milieu, right? You want to talk about that? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the thing that jumped out at me from the very beginning, from the flaming sword to Crowley's... Uh, reptilian eyes that looked like the most painful scleral contact lenses I've ever seen, but were obviously CG, is that every... No, no, they were con apparently they were contact lenses. Were they really? They looked like, it looked like a terrible bulbous effect. And if they really were practical, then uh, I've never respected an actor more. David Tennant's <laughs> suffering through those. Uh, but everything from explosions to, uh, you know, to Satan, uh, to just about everything, it was marked by a real hokiness, which to me felt incredible incredibly, uh, probably both pragmatic given the budget that they had to work with, but also totally consistent with how they dealt with, with religion in the book. And this, of course, has come out in some of the, the, the boycotts that uh, the evangelical right is trying, to, uh, is trying to bring against, notably not Amazon, but Netflix, hilariously enough, who didn't even air Good Omens. But, um, yeah, Peter, do you want to just explain that for people who haven't followed this? Sure. So just in the past few days, um, we've seen a call to uh, to boycott Netflix for airing Good Omens based on the fact that the show Good Omens is incredibly amenable to Satanism and uh, and it mocks Christianity and it mocks well, the larger sort of Western Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, which, of course, overlooks the fact that Netflix did not make Good Omens. Um, but of course, what you know, growing up in England especially when Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett did, it is nearly impossible not to absorb uh, the Anglican influence. And so religion is, and Tom can speak to this more, having lived in England uh, for some duration, that is just part of that culture, that culture as it was, especially outside uh, of London itself and, and in sort of the areas like Lower Tadfield. Uh, and so... I think the just inherent silliness of the book of revelations is something that you really need hokey special effects to be able to deal with, especially when you're coming at it from a comic perspective. This was not, uh, this was not un unblinking Sturm und Drang. This was finding the silliness in the folklore that is the end of the new Testament. Well, yeah, I mean, let me just say about that petition because I think it's it's easy to make fun of this petition and laugh at it and Amazon and um, Netflix have been on Twitter, like making fun of it and stuff. But I feel like there's an, a more important point I want to make about that is that, you know, 20,000 people signed this petition and people recognize that this is no big deal. You know, in a country of almost 400 million people, like 20,000 people on the Internet upset about something is nothing. And I just wish that they took that same perspective more often. Because I just feel like, you know, so often, like, you know, a hundred people on Twitter will be upset about something or something like that. And it seems like the end of the world, but it's such a small number of people. And yeah, I just I just hope that they take this sort of not taking this too seriously attitude toward all these kinds of Internet outrage things in the future. But but they but they won't. And and I think a lot of it has to do with who's doing the complaining and whether it's sanctioned to take these people seriously or not. And there are just some groups that we feel very comfortable making fun of and other groups that we don't feel comfortable making fun of. And I'm not really saying that's right or wrong, but it is what it is. And you could have lots of people in the former category not make a ripple. 
and we can all sort of snigger into our sleeves, but, you know, a, a small number of, of people in another category can, can make a ripple, especially if, uh, you know, especially if they uh, employ some of the more powerful trolling tactics. Right. But I just feel like it's, you know, what gives them power is that oftentimes these TV networks cave to them. And if the TV networks didn't cave to them, there goes their power, you know. I think this this really harkens back, you know, it's funny that we started the podcast talking about, you know, Douglas Adams and, and comic fantasy of the 80s when, you know, it really harkens back to the satanic panic that people freaked out about all these different texts that they saw as having the sort of evil um, influence on the youth. And it just goes to show that none of the 20,000 people who have seen, who have signed the petition, I would wager, have the slightest understanding of either author's work or have seen a moment of the show. They just read a description of it and take it at face value. Yeah. I, I could get all political about it, but I suspect Dave won't thank me for it. So I'm just going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the show, I mean, the show is kind of like poking fun at religion. I mean, there's this whole, there's this part where, um, you know, with Noah's Ark and, you know, Aziraphale's like, wait, are they really going to kill all these people? I mean, it's, you know, it's not, um, you know, it has a, it has a viewpoint, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's, a, it's think... a very classically British viewpoint, too, uh, at right. the risk of generalizing. Um, you know, if you look at the, uh, at the, the sort of stats on who considers themselves religious in the, in the OECD and they, the, the, the Brits in general um, don't in general. It's a huge statement, obviously, but I, I think the humor there is a lot more comfortable with agnosticism and atheism than it certainly than is the case in the United States, for example. I also think that something that that makes that sets sets its crosshairs on the hypocrisy in a given religion is a much different sort of irreligious or irreverent satire than a sort. It's not an aggressive nihilist atheism in my mind at all this is something that yep. that is like finding the love you know the, yep. the faith that Aziraphale has is absolutely valorized in this it's it's the hypocrisy that kind of dictates that they each have this completely black and white moral stance is is the thing that sort of comes under fire so to I, me it's, it's kind of two different strains yeah I, I agree with that a lot I, I'm a I'm a practicing Catholic and I don't find my, I mean, I guess there's some stuff in, in the book and the movie that you could find objectionable if you really tried, but I don't find it too objectionable. And I think probably, probably the majority of, of Christians would feel that way. And probably the, the ones who are speaking out are a pretty small minority. Like you guys said, they probably haven't, haven't watched it or read it. Um, but I, I do find it, even when I read it back in, in, uh, you know, back in the nineties, I found it to be a kind of a playful fun, like the kind of fun that my brothers and I would, would have talking about church or, you know, just like jokes you would tell you, like, well, I go to church and I, you know, I believe what I believe, but I, but at the same time, I poke fun at the hypocrisies or certain things about it that I, that I find silly. So I think this is done in that spirit of like, you know, kind of a reverent, hmm. uh, a reverent humor, poking fun. I think it is a gentle fun, but I will I will loop it back again to I I do feel it's another case of, of a safe target. I think it's a lot safer, um, perhaps again for good reason to to poke fun at Christianity than it is, for example, if you if you had a show like that poking fun um, at another religion, <laughs> de depending very much on who made it, um, or perhaps not. I I might be wrong about that, but my guess is depending on who made it. Um, it would be received perhaps in a different spirit. Yeah, you're right. Let me ask you, yeah. I mean, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to, I absolutely agree, Aaron, that it's, that's 100% dependent on the creator, right? right? Because, you know, obviously leveling accusations or satirizing a religion that you didn't grow up in, as Neil Gaiman and, and Terry Pratchett so obviously were, uh, you know, it, it that's a completely different, sort of situation that we're talking about here. So I totally agree. This may be just particular to me, but did anyone else wonder about this? So the, uh, the story is narrated by God and it makes you, it makes, gives me the feeling that God is omniscient, but then somehow Aziraphale thinks that he can keep all this stuff secret from God. Like, why does he well, think? 
there there was but there was a lot said about how Azir fell uh well about how maybe this was all part of God's plan like that Azir yeah. fell and Crowley would uh would break away from the bureaucracy of heaven and hell and do their own thing might have been actually part of God's plan. God's plan is ineffable. They but, use this word a lot and so they're they're rolling the dice that what they're doing is not outside of God's ken but rather that God's going to be secretly winking at them going good job boys you're the only ones who worked it out. Right. That's I mean, how that, I took it anyway. That's the way it seemed at the end but it wasn't clear to me that when Azira fails you know started you know, consor uh, consorting or what's the word, you know, you know, plotting with uh, Crowley or whatever that he would have necessarily thought this was he's doing God's plan. I, I seem to recall a conversation, one of the better lines in the show and indeed in the book to that effect where, uh, you know, at first Aziraphale is like, no, I can't I can't disobey heaven. And Crowley is the scene where they're getting drunk and Crowley's like, yeah, but how do you know you're you're going against, you might be going against the bureaucracy, but are you actually going against God's ineffable plan? Your job is to thwart my wiles. You see a while, you thwart. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> and that, and so he kind of persuades him in that way. And, and you can sort of see this dawning on Aziraphale's face that, that yes, actually, who could possibly object if I'm, if I'm, all I'm doing is thwarting your evil deeds. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I feel to... like it was meant to be explicit. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, uh, that sounds that sounds pretty convincing. I'll have to go back and watch that though. Right, and and Francis McDormand was, you know, or or God was narrating this, but I don't think Aziraphale knew God was narrating it, <laughs> and he and he, and he kind of thought, you know, he kind of thought that he was in some sort of obscurity, that he was unnoticed for six thousand years. So, so I have kind of a silly question about this, and that is, I'm not finished with the book. Uh, and Dave, you haven't read the book, but is the narrator in the book ever recognized to be the voice of God? Not in the book. No. Know. Okay. Be because not that I also, it's not particularly explicit in the show either. So what they've done is they've kind of retconned this to be the voice of God. And certainly in announcing the casting of Francis McDormand, Neil Gaiman explicitly said we cast her as God. But there's nothing in the show itself, unless it's the closed captions that you're looking at, <laughs> yeah, that say well, God. Right. That it no, could there, just be. Well, there is oh, though. Is it explicit? It's explicitly pointed out. Sorry, I totally yes. missed it. It's so. right, at, but it's it's pretty subtle. It's right in the opening monologue that she gives, where you're going kind of all the the pictures of the universe, where she's going through the this prediction and that prediction, and she says that this proves that God does not play dice with the universe. I play my own game, uh, and she she uh, she yeah. splis, explicitly flips it briefly to the first person, which doesn't happen in the book. In the book, it remains someone mm -hmm. saying God is having this poker game that nobody else understands. But but in right. the show, she actually says I. Okay. Which I probably wouldn't have noticed, but I did a rewatch of that uh, that first episode because I wanted – my husband was away while I was doing the watching for the most part. Um, and I kind of wanted to rewatch that first episode with him to see – to kind of gaze, gauge his reaction and see whether it was similar to mine, which it wasn't. But that's another thing. Actually, the the thing I wish I had, I thought all of it was pretty clear, even if you haven't read the book. But the one part I got a little confused about is there's this part where it turns out that both Crowley and Aziraphale have hired Shadwell, hmm. except to like, he's, who does he think they are? And he's also lying to them, telling them that he has all these assistants that he doesn't? Or I was a little confused about what was going on at yeah, that point. Yeah, he... he... He's so there was this big witch finder army that used to exist back in the 1600s, and now it's just him. And you know, there used to be a witch finder general and and all these different you know per, all these different ranks, and now there's just him, and he's a witch finder sergeant. And then he you know basically recruits uh, Newt, who's now who's a, a witch finder private, <laughs> and that's it. But but in, but before he had Newt, he he wanted to make it seem like, you know, he can't have a witch finder army with just one sergeant. So he made up all these other people. And then he kind of ran out of, like, he had, like, witch finder general so-and-so and witch finder, you know, all these different names. And then he, he, he ran out of fake names. So he had, like, witch finder, uh, marshal, milk bottle. And, and uh, you know, he just, he's like, whatever. They don't, Crowley and Aziraphale never, like, check his roster. They never, like, read that far into his reports. So... He just and who, who did he think that they were who That's had hired him? He, he didn't think they were a demon and an angel. He thought they were 
Like, because he keeps calling Aziraphale the great southern pansy, and he he just thinks he's somebody important who like needs an operative who's a witch finder. And I think the same thing with 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 uh, Crowley. He doesn't think they're an angel and a demon, though. No, no, I, I got. I, I was. I, yeah. I don't think it's expressly addressed. If it is, I I don't recall either in the book or in the, uh, in the show. Certainly not in the show. Uh, like what what is he thinking? Who does he think he works for? Um, and you you would have to think that he would care at some point, right? Like, yeah, when if he it is a... indeed the case that his entire order is extinct, then surely <laughs> it would be of interest to him well, he that he wasn't the money. only person on the planet. That he has to do it because they pay him. Right. He, he, there's a there's a passage in the book that I just read yesterday where he has to do it because they're paying him, and it, they said you know back in the day you used to get nine pence for every witch you pointed out, which uh, which made it pretty pretty you know pretty biased because you would just be like well I I need to eat so I got to keep finding witches, which I think may have been true I'm not sure but anyway he had to keep finding witches and uh, and today you know 9 pence doesn't go as far and he's not finding that many witches so he's not getting any money and he's he's broke so these guys pay him i think they give him 60 pounds a year each and that's pretty much his only income he buys a lot of condensed milk though so that's right yeah. <laughs> so what did you i mean what you guys think of the romantic relationships in the show cuz i wasn't totally sold on them i thought it was i mean uh, when um, Shadwell and uh, Madame Tracy get together at the end, that just seemed really weird to me that he's just been shouting at her that she's a harlot the whole time. And then they get together. I know, Tom, you said that you thought there was more subtext there or something. But then also even just the thing with um, uh, Newton and um, Anathema, like, you know, they just kind of meet. And then the, <laughs> you know, she's like, oh, well, the prophecy says we're going to hook up now so they do and i i just i don't know i felt like it was a you no know, there wasn't a lot to those relations you know the romantic part of those relationships that's where the book does a lot better that's where um you know they did a good job of taking a lot of that hypnotic comedic narration in the book and putting it into the show but there were some places where they didn't or where they couldn't and that's that's where that fell down because in the book it's a lot clearer that from the beginning um shadwell does have a romantic interest in Madame Tracy. It's it's sort of not not clear at the beginning, but it becomes gradually clearer and clearer throughout the book, and it makes sense at the end. And um and the uh, yeah the anathema and Newt romance that's never really there, but they just kind of show they they kind of do a better job of showing how how it happens. Like he's he's just kind of always awkward around women, and no women have ever been interested in him. And she's known her whole life that she's going to fall in love with him. So she's waiting and waiting and waiting for him. So when he shows up, she's like, oh, not what I expected, but, you know, I can work with this. So she, she's, she's ready for that to happen. And he's just kind of shocked. And I don't know, it just, it doesn't make a lot of, a lot of sense when you try to describe it. But when you read the book, they just kind of, the narrators just kind of put you in this trance where you're like, okay, yeah, this kind of makes sense. And it just, it's kind of like a Stephen King movie. Like it doesn't come across on screen as well as it does on on the page. Also, some of the pacing really differs between the book and the movie. A lot of things that happen much earlier in the book get pushed to later in the show, just for it to unfold the way that it does. And so it doesn't feel quite as, I guess, um, contrived <laughs> to, for for lack of a better term in in the book as it does in the show. I, I don't think I, I would have to say as someone who's quite partial to romance storylines in general. I don't think any of them are, are terribly satisfying in either medium. Um, but they, they certainly do have more flesh on the bones in the, in the book. Uh, the, the romance I wanted to see never happens. Um, uh, and yeah. I, I was like, if you're not shipping the, <laughs> from the demon, you're doing it wrong. I think. Um, and it's interesting because actually I, for, for a moment there, I thought maybe they were, they were actually going to go down that road. There's this one scene where Xerophel delivers the holy water to, to Crowley and Crowley offers to take him just to give him a ride. He's like, do you need a ride anywhere? And there's just something about the way that scene was acted and looking back on it. Uh, so in the moment, I completely took this line, not literally. So Aziraphale looks at him and gives him this pain look and says, you go too fast for me, Crowley. Mm. And in the moment, I totally took that as a, like, as a relationship comment. 
Whereas looking back, I realize he literally means Crowley drives too fast, which is way less fun <laughs> than the interpretation I gave it. But maybe it was meant to have that duality because there was something about the way it was acted that suggested that there I was think, more yeah. to that statement. My, I think my, one of the best parts of Michael Sheen's performance as Aziraphale is there is it's hard to ignore this sort of the the that his longing is and his resistance to acknowledge the closeness that they have is rooted in something far far deeper and what people are reacting to I think that there's there understandably is an instinct in most I think fan friendly IP to ship prominent male characters who have a close relationship. And in this, I feel like it isn't, it, this is, it's not something that's fabricated. This is, if not in the book as much, is seated really deliberately. And, and I like to think affectionately by Gaiman. Yeah, they, they definitely, uh, it wasn't in the book. And in fact, in the book, there's a line that says, uh, uh, everybody who's ever met Aziraphale just assumed he's, he's gay. And they use some metaphor in there. He's as gay as something, something about cycling remember. monkeys, which I was like, okay, that's interesting. I'm not sure what's gay about cycling monkeys, but anyway. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I vaguely remember <laughs> that. But then they said, but, you know, the, the truth is angels are actually sexless unless they make a really concerted effort not to be. And um, But then in the in the movie, or in the show, rather, they definitely added some dialogue there because there was a line where uh, Crowley says, look, you and I could run away together. And Aziravel looks really like he really wants to do that. He looks almost pained, or yeah. not almost. He looks pained, and he says, "We could." And he says, "Yeah." And he's like, "Well, where would we go?" And and that's not in the book. They added that in. So I think they definitely were making a concentrated effort to to change that relationship from just a bromance to an actual romance in the in the show. But then why not go all in? Why be so coy about it? No idea. This, I don't know. It's it's interesting because. Uh, Okay, so yeah, I definitely had much more of that sense in the show than I recall having in the book. Um, even though in the book, as you say, it's it's made explicit that most people, when they meet Aziraphale, assume he's gay. Um, so, you know, it's it's not something they just plucked out of nowhere. And yet, yeah, the, they, they are willing to push it further, but not very far. Like, I just, it's, it's confusing to me why you just do or do not. There is no try. Maybe it's it was how the, I feel. maybe it was the the thing we were talking about earlier, where um you know Gaiman was was trying to be as faithful to the book as possible because Pratchett was dead, and maybe he really wanted to do that, but he was like, well, I can't consult with with Terry Pratchett, obviously. So you know, maybe there were a lot of things that he wanted to change that he felt like, well, I really can't. I mean, I I I, I didn't read. I just saw a headline where it said like, you know, that all these people are shipping these characters, and Neil Gaiman was like giving his blessing to that but I, I don't i don't know any more details about that but yeah um, i mean i saw a couple of interviews with cast members where they were where they were talking about it but they were of course uh, completely coy about it because i think it's not really for them to say when the creator is also part of the process it's really if anyone's gonna clarify the matter it's not gonna be them um i guess i'll just also say i mean that just uh, you know, we've had a lot of critiques of this show, but just reading over the comments I've gotten from listeners and friends and stuff, the reaction has been overwhelmingly positive. So I just want to note that, that this show is really working for, you know, it seems like most people. I do wonder how many of those commenters have read the book because, um, and, you know, we've talked a little bit, we've got at least two people on the panel that haven't read the book, but I still feel like it probably works better if you have read the book. I think you're probably more forgiving and nostalgic of those parts that don't really land um, than you would be if you hadn't read the book. And I do wonder how many of those people, it'd be interesting to know how many of them had or hadn't. But at the same time, I think that there's a, a kind of a nice oblivion to anything lost in translation if you if you haven't if you haven't read the book. So I think initially its audience was people who had read the book. I mean, these were the people who were excited for the show, but as time has gone on, I've heard more anecdotally from folks who I know who have gone to watch the show after they heard some of the conversation around it and have told me how delightful they found it and how, mm -hmm. how much they absolutely loved it. Kind of in the very beginning, I, you know, I wrote a piece about the show that landed the day that it, that it came out and Neil Gaiman actually tweeted the story and said something really kind of lovely about how he felt like 
our story made it clear that we understood what he was trying to do with the show. And nice. so after seeing that, I got to see like how people were responding to his tweet about that. And it, it obviously the people who follow Neil Gaiman and are responding to his tweets are <laughs> imaginably, you know, presumably those who have read the book and are waiting for the show. So like, that was my early slice seeing how people who loved the book responded overwhelmingly positively and over time as that kind of sample size has changed to, to people who are new to the idea of it, uh, it's been a similar proportion, actually, I think, of, uh, of positive response. I mean, you said you got a screener, right? An advanced screener? Yeah, I, I watched the episodes a little bit early, just like a week or so. I mean, is there anything more to say about what it was like watching it before anyone else did or before most people did or reviewing it and stuff like that? You, you know, it's a you, when you're reviewing a show or a movie, you, you know, that experience is is always interesting because on one hand, you are doing it in the absolute vacuum, uh, an absence of influence. Oftentimes, when you sit down to write about a book or a show or a movie, you don't want to look to see what other people thought about it because you want to sort of preserve the integrity of your insight or whatever they are uh in, in, insight i think is is far, far more grandiose than things i actually have the opinions that you have uh, about a given text but often it's when i really enjoy something that i'm watching in that vacuum i always sort of second guess it because what happened you know it's not what happened because you have to stand by the thing that you feel about a thing that you're consuming but there is this interesting sort of dissonance that can happen if you hate something and then you kind of tear it apart and then everybody loves it or vice versa if you love something and talk about it unabashedly and then everybody comes down and also has thoughtful negative things to say has thoughtful critiques of it you end up sort of doubting your own critical chops. And so it's difficult to watch something early without so, without engaging with that sort of self-doubt, but it was difficult not to have faith, so to speak, uh, <laughs> in, in the fact that I enjoyed the show just because I knew very little about it. I had, you know, I had attended the panel at Comic-Con last year. I knew what the concept of it was. I knew who had been cast, though at the time I didn't know how prominent Gabriel would be or or whoever it was. And I think Michael McKean might have been on the panel. Um, I just knew that these people were in it. And so watching it was the sort of best kind of surprise. Uh, you know, when you see something before the word of mouth starts, uh, it, it's rare to be totally surprised by the quality of that thing or to have it kind of hit you out of the blue. Um, you know, this year, I would say Good Omens was the show that I enjoyed the most behind Russian Doll, um, which I think is one of the kind of best shows of the past few years. And it's certainly on my like best surprises list. Do you know what I mean? Like, because I didn't know what to expect, but I ended up having a blast with it. There's just one other. Okay, so I just have one other random question I want to ask before we run out of time here. So there's a scene where they're in the bookshop and Gabriel says something like, I smell the presence of evil. And somebody says, I th that's just the Jeffrey Archer books. <laughs> and I'm honestly not that familiar with Jeffrey Archer. I'm just wondering, can someone explain that joke to me? I think it's just a dig, isn't it? Has, I don't know. I didn't no one... really think about it that much. I have no, I've never read his stuff. Either. He's a thriller writer, isn't he? That's my impression. The only th the only thing I ever heard about him was somebody joked one time. Apparently, he's a really relentless self promoter, and I heard somebody joke one time that they had a rare unsigned copy of one of his books. <laughs> <laughs> but that's wow. all. I I've never read any of them. I don't really know too much about him. So actually, while while we're on the topic of sort of bringing in these real world influences that pop up every so often in in good omens the the running queen gag that any tape left in a car long yeah. enough will turn into queen's greatest hits yeah to to me in the book certainly felt like a dig in the show it it wasn't really acknowledged as such and then queen was thanked pretty explicitly in the uh in the acknowledge not the acknowledgments because shows don't have that but kind of towards the end you know, special thanks to Queen. And it felt much more loving in the show than it did in the book. Yeah, I think that's a function of the times. Because uh, in, in uh, you know, 1990, when this came out, Queen was like super popular. And I think, you know, maybe Pratchett and Gaiman were like, oh, anything that's super popular, especially if it came over uh, from, well, wait a minute, Freddie Mercury, 
I want to say he's American, but is he? I, I don't really no. know. No, no, he's, he's British. A, Okay, British so, so maybe well, somebody's he's from super... Zanzibar, actually, if you want to be technical about <laughs> oh, it. Oh, <laughs> wow. I did not know that. But um, he grew so up I, in the I don't know. UK. Anyways, something super popular like pop music back then that had been played and played and played all through the 80s, and here we are in the 90s kind of moving away from it. I right. think it's maybe easier to, to do a dig at that, whereas now we're having all this nostalgia for Queen. There's a movie that just came out. Everybody's really into it, and um, and I think maybe they, you know, they're just kind of trying to cater to the times a little bit more. And also, when Good Omens came out, we were a lot closer to the radio goo goo, radio gaga. That's right. Uh, you know, incarnation of Queen than we were to That's some right. of their older stuff. So I get it. All the queens are good queens. <laughs> 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 um, I actually would kind of well, I don't know if it would have worked in the in the in the street the age of streaming music, but I, I actually kind of wish that. I love that they left the queen in there, and maybe it's best that they that they didn't beat you over the head with why there's so much queen in it. Um, but it, you know, the, the joke was funny, um, about, I thought about leaving tapes, like every time Crowley reaches into his glove compartment and scrabbles around and we all remember doing this, I think scrabbles yeah. around for a tape and he pulls out Verdi and he's going to, you know, listen to classical music, but it's always described as something like, you know, the, the four seasons by Freddie Mercury or whatever. That's right. <laughs> That's right. It's always clean. And I, I love that. The other thing. I think the best thing about the show other than um, so that's like my second best thing about the show, other than the relationship of uh, the two leads. The third best thing about the show is the opening credits, which I never skipped one time. I loved them. And I loved oh, yeah. that they unfurl in a way, like they yes. reveal themselves to you over time because the first few episodes, when you watch them, you don't necessarily know what you're looking at. You you know that you're looking at Aziraphale and Crowley, but all the things that are going on in the background, very Monty Python kind of visuals, you don't really know what they are. But as each episode goes on, some of those characters and those backdrops are folded in. Right. So you see the Kraken and you see the aliens and it all starts to make sense. It's like the ineffable plan. Right. <laughs> so it all starts to come together and be more effable. I don't, is that a word? Uh, <laughs> yeah, going forward. So I loved it. I watched it every time. Yeah. yeah and, initial... the, uh, and, and the, the, um, it also reminded me a lot of the opening credits, both the art and the music reminded me of the opening credits of Masterpiece Theater that used to be on when I was a kid. I don't know if anybody oh, yeah. remembers that. Absolutely, with the blunderbuss. Must have been very different from the opening credits of <laughs> Masterpiece Theater that I had, which was velvet curtains and a really poncy trumpet line. No, no, mine was an animation. There was like a little detective in the bushes and somebody yep. would hear a scream and the camera would oh, pan boy. over and you'd see somebody sinking... You know, I remember exactly what you're. Yep, I remember exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Though it didn't have a janky ass UFO fluttering to the surface, but other than no. that, very similar. So, I don't know if anybody watches Supernatural or has ever watched Supernatural. I have always assumed that it's not a coincidence that the demon in that is is a is a wisecracking Brit called Crowley. Huh. That's I interesting. Got, I got crickets here. <laughs> well, 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 because you know, there's Alistair Crowley, who's the famous sort of occultist so not necessarily every crowley would be you know i think a lot of right. people would be naming crow you know demons and stuff after him not necessarily this character and, and i but, and i assume i assumed that in good omen so i just i absolutely loved how they traced it back to crowley being to the crowley. serpent's name yeah, i was that just was like cool. that little bit of of kind of backstory just made it so rewarding for me dave yeah. do we have time to mention my uh my friend uh who's a descendant of of some of the people in, uh, that are yeah yeah sure I mean yeah we we need to start wrapping this up pretty soon but hit us quick with the uh, the historical thing. So I was at a dinner party last night and this friend of mine named Shannon Nutter was there and I said hey uh I've been I thought I thought about you today because I've been rereading Good Omens by Terry Pratchett and he started nodding and uh and he goes yeah 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 and I said Agnes Nutter and he goes right Agnes Nutter he goes yeah it's based on a person that's actually a relative of mine. And it turns out that there's no, there was no Agnes Nutter, but one of the last people to be executed as a witch in London, or in England rather, in Lancashire, England, was uh, Alice Nutter. And that was, uh, that's a, a distant relation. You're of kidding. His. No. And it, I and always it, assumed they meant Nutter in the British sense of Nutter, so, and that was just another well, rye dig. It's actually just like a rye dig of gods then, if it's anything, because, <laughs> because it's real. There's an Alice Nutter and an Alison Device. 
and uh, and they were both executed as witches. There was like nine witches executed in this Lancashire witch trial. This is a very famous witch trial in England, and um, they're in the UK. And uh, and then they moved over to you know, the the descendants. I don't know if it was a hundred years later or something like that. Moved moved to West Virginia and, and founded Nutter Fort, West Virginia. And that was his grandfather who founded Nutter Fort, West Virginia. So it must have been over a hundred years later, because it was 1612 that Alice Nutter was was executed. And uh, and then there's another. He told me that one of his relatives was, uh, or one of his other ancestors was called Hate Evil Nutter. So that <laughs> you know the the in the book they have the Thou shalt not commit adultery, Pulsifer. That's based on reality. There was a Hate Evil Nutter. And he he apparently wrote Bibles that are really rare, but they're they're very coveted within the Nutter family. So, so, so I asked him, I said, I said, so do you have any occult leanings? Do you have any prophetic kind of, do you have any visions? Do you, you know, can you tell me where the end of the world is or anything like that? And he said, no, but he said, I do get a general feeling of doom over our current presidency. <laughs> yeah. So. That's a strong prophecy. <laughs> Is it true? I, I always meant to look this up. It says in the book that nice used to mean exact, scrupulously exact. Is that scrupulously exact is that the case <laughs> because i i don't know that it's going to pop up in merriam webster i don't know but if you look up the it's called the pendle witch trials which was in lancashire lancashire and uh if you look that up the way the reason we know about those today is because there was a um there was a a book or a, a fo folio or whatever that's that this guy wrote right after the witch trials and it was called the wonderful I think it was like the wonderful or the wondrous witch trials of of, Pen, of Pendle, it, but but he uses it made me think of nice and accurate because he says something like wonderful, which you know wonderful used to mean horrifying because wonder is original the original meaning of wonder was horror, but he he says the wonderful discovery of witches in Pendle, and he didn't mean wonderful like this is really cool he meant horrifying <laughs> so it, it made me think about nice and accurate and wonder if like that's where Pratchett and Gaiman got that from was reading through those accounts and being like, why do they say wonderful? Could be. All right. Yeah. So we are pretty much out of time. So how about just let's get some final thoughts from everyone. So um, Peter, final thoughts on uh, Good Omens. Final thoughts. I, I, I'm glad in retrospect that I saw it unburdened by the book, but now I'm enjoying the book in an entirely different way. And I just, I think it's a wonderful show regardless of if you're a genre fan or not. All right, cool. And Aaron, final thoughts? Yeah, I thought I thought it was a delight, and it just makes me wish that there were more humorous fantasy out there, or at least <laughs> more humorous fantasy that's making waves out there, because I think it's a genre that's just, it's too much fun. It's a great sandbox to play in for humor, and it doesn't all have to be of the Douglas Adams, Terry Pratchett vein, but it, I would just I would just love for, for that to be appreciated and to, to see more of it. Well, so now that you're a famous author slash podcast guest, do you think you ever might publish those uh, humorous <laughs> fantasy manuscripts? Well, I mean, maybe. There's certainly a lot of humor in what I'm writing now, and I would love to sort of gravitate back toward it. And I do think my my own entirely anecdotal, unscientific view is that there does seem to be an uptick um, in more more humorous takes. I well, I like to th I like to think we're done with grimdark. I I am so tired of it, um, but I am I am informed by the gurus uh, in the in the agencies that in fact we might be prepared to boomerang back to it. Which I was like, did we ever leave? <laughs> <laughs> did we yeah. ever leave the 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 white dude dark as fantasy? Anyways, whatever. <laughs> Not that I'm bitter. No, but yeah, I mean, like I've said many times, I mean, I grew up loving Robert Asprin and Douglas Adams, and, you know, I always think there should be more of that. Uh, Tom, final thoughts? Yeah, I thought it was I thought it was very well done. I, I like the book a lot more, but um, I thought it was it's really hard to take all that brilliant narration and turn it into a TV show. Um, but I thought they did a really good job of it. And also, uh, obviously, a big part of that is down to Neil Gaiman being uh, being heavily involved with producing it. And uh, yeah, anybody who, who has read the book will probably enjoy the show, and anybody who hasn't read the book will probably enjoy it too. So it's a it's a good good watch for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was charming. I mean, I um I feel like we've talked a lot about criticisms of it, but I think that's probably just because there's so much going on in the book. There's a lot to talk about and a lot potentially to criticize. But 
I, I, I enjoyed the heck out of it. And um, yeah, I, I would definitely encourage anyone if you, you know, if you think it sounds interesting at all to go check it out. It's a um, relaxing watch and, and we could, we could all use more of that. that, that that's why I will defend, you know, something like, like stranger things to, to, to the end, because to say that it's not original or not subversive to me is totally missing the point. It's not. <laughs> and it's a delight. It is a, it's like, it's just fluffy, fun, and it's good to watch. And, and I mean, good omens here. It's just, it's fluffy and fun. And it's, it's not, it's the antidote to Game of Thrones. But it also is, it is kind of subversive too. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I I did kind of glide seamlessly between my Stranger <laughs> Things and and Good Omens. Um, but yeah, there there's definitely lots of subversion going on in a Book of Mormon kind of way. Um, <laughs> but just in terms of stretching boundaries of of the genre, maybe not so much. But that but it's also been around for a long time, so it's not even yeah. a fair standard to it's, apply. It's subversive in a cuddly way. Basically. Very cuddly. Yeah, it's such a light. Threatening. <laughs> yeah, it's it's totally fangless. Like this is not a venomous sort of satire. That's right. It's a declawed Book of Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. So we've been speaking with Aaron Lindsay, Tom Grenzer, and Peter Rubin. So thanks everyone so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks a lot. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Aaron Lindsay, Tom Garenser, and Peter Rubin for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to Mads Frederick Geisler, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.